in the gospel for this week and in the extraordinary form, this very familiar gospel, the story of the Good Samaritan, as we have come to refer to it. And it's very easy for the preacher to simply focus in on that beautiful, heartfelt story of the Good Samaritan and talk about what it means to be a good neighbor, to love our neighbor as ourselves. But it struck me, quite honestly, that as I reflected and prayed over this scripture gospel for this weekend, to go way back in the story of the gospel, long before the story of the law of the Good Samaritan is told, and to focus in on a meditation on the first commandment, the greatest commandment of the law. I think it's a beautiful story and reflection on what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves as the second commandment. But let's not forget that the question was, what must I do to gain everlasting life? And the lawyer, young lawyer, was he was asking that question. Jesus says to him, well, what does the law say? What is written in the law? How do you interpret it? And the young lawyer gives the right answer. You shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. How often can we say in our lives that we truly do love God above everything else, above every one else? A good examination of conscience, I would dare say, for ourselves might be to step back from our own life and our subjective, obvious, subjective participation in our own life. We, we are obviously deeply, personally immersed in the living of our own life. And it's hard to be anything but subjective about that. Because it is, after all, our life that we are living. We are in our own skin. But wouldn't it be a good exercise, a good examination, if you will, of conscience to be able to somehow step back from our own life, to step out of ourselves, if you will, to get a, a bird's eye view, if you will, of our life, to observe our life as God observes it. Or perhaps that's a little too lofty to think of. How about this? How about we step back and observe our life as an examination of conscience, an examination of life, as our guardian angel observes our life? Ah, maybe we can relate a little bit more to that. Let's not forget that our guardian angel is very real. It's not just some childhood fantasy portrayed in the beautiful image of the guardian angel helping the little children across the wooden bridge over the creek that we are all so familiar with. Our guardian angels are real. They are there as our protectors, as our guardians. And our guardian angel observes our life. And Mary, maybe we forget about our guardian angel sometimes. We forget that, that our guardian angel is with us all the time, observing us. Wouldn't it be interesting to have a little chat with our guardian angel and to ask our guardian angel, how am I doing in living this commandment? In other words, objectively looked at, does my life reflect that I do indeed love God above everything else, that my whole life is dedicated to my love of God, that my whole being serves God, loves God above everything else. Would our guardian angels say that the way we live our life each day 
every action of ours, every word that we would speak, every thought that we would have. Yes, our guardian angel knows even our thoughts. Would every thought, word, and action of ours truly be a witness to the fact that we love the Lord our God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength? I would dare say, I'll just speak for myself. I won't speak for you. I know that there would be many moments throughout the day when my guardian angel would say to me, ah, ah, ah. That thought that you just had did not show your love for God above everything else. That sharp word just spoken in impatience was not a word spoken that reflects your love for God. That unkind action or that selfish action did not show that you love God above everything else. I think uh, it could be a very fruitful exercise for us, maybe perhaps as we do that daily examine, which we are asked to do, which is probably one of the greatest fruits for the spiritual life, the daily examination of conscience, that brief examine that we would do before we go to sleep at night. Not a detailed, extensive examination of conscience, but a few moments to reflect on the day, to see how we did this day. What did I do wrong? What did I do well? And what could I have done better? To ask the guard, guardian angel to give us a little light. To talk to our guardian angel and to see it from his perspective or her perspective. You shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart, with your whole soul, with all your strength with all your mind. That's the goal for us. That's the call to holiness. And we cannot love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and not then love our neighbor as ourself. And that's the intimate connection between the two commandments. You can't do one and not the other. This focus on our love for God in our life, that, that He is everything to us, that He is the center. I will make a connection here, perhaps, to our celebration of the extraordinary form. Those of us who have experienced this form of the, of the Latin rite, of the Roman rite of the Church, see clearly in this rite an orientation and a focus which is on God, not on us. The whole orientation of this sacred liturgy is clearly on God. Even the orientation of prayer. And this is this orientation of prayer that we use here is probably one of the more, if you will, controversial elements in the minds of some in the more modern sense of this liturgy. You will hear people say things like, well, I don't like it when the priest turns his back on me. That's not what this is about. It's not about the priest turning his back on anyone. It's about the priest facing the Lord God with you. Someone once pointed out what happens in a liturgy, and, and perhaps I betray some of my own sentiments spiritually with regard to the sacred liturgy. What happens when we face one another at the altar? When the priest stands on this side of the altar and faces the congregation, which, quite honestly, if you polled people, I'm sure, would probably be the preferred orientation. But what happens then? Where is the focus? We become almost a circle. And we're focused within. 
We're focused on each other. And, and I've heard people say, I don't like this because I can't see the priest's face when he's celebrating the Mass. Well, you're not supposed to be looking at the priest's face. Our focus is on Christ, on God. And so, when we're facing one another, priest and people, there's an inward sort of focus, and there's a focus on us. And we see this even portrayed in some of the hymnody of the church. We have so many hymns that we see to sing today that are focused on us. Gather us in, the rich and the haughty, the blind and the lame. It's a very inward focus on us. And I can list many others. So there's no longer an orientation of prayer and song toward God, but it becomes very focused on us, gathered in worship. And that's not the orientation and focus of the sacred liturgy. And so, in the extraordinary form, when the priest faces the crucifix in this case, we can't say we're facing east, otherwise we'd have to stand on that side of the altar and face that way, but that's, that's the general intention here, is that priest and people face east, the direction of the rising sun, the direction from which Christ will come again in his glory, the eschatological orientation of the liturgy that we look for the end time and Pope Benedict XVI speaks so beautifully about the cosmic nature of the liturgy. He talks about, we celebrate here what has already happened, the already, what Christ has accomplished in his Paschal mystery, his death and resurrection, but we also have a focus and an orientation on the not yet, the yet to come, the eschatological orientation of the liturgy, the end times when Christ will come again in glory. We, we turn to him in prayer as we await his return in glory. And as we do so, we participate in the heavenly liturgy, which goes on now in the presence of the angels. And so, when you hear people describe this liturgy and the priest, so to speak, turning his back on us, correct them. It's not about that. It's about all of us, priest and people, together, united in prayer, facing Christ, represented by the crucifix. Our focus and our orientation is on Him. Our worship is directed toward the Almighty God, whom we should love with our whole heart, all our soul, our whole strength, and with all of our mind.